All right, everyone. So I just got finished uh, recording this next chapter. Now, it's going to be a little bit different than what I've done before. Usually, I uh, sometimes have some notes. Uh, you know, that that's how I did it in Memories of Ice. I would have some notes as I would go through the book or whatever. Um, but I wouldn't be reading off of them. Or sometimes I just go totally off the cuff. Now, this was a big major chapter and I spent this last day kind of considering what I wanted to get out of it I recorded a whole hour before kind of going scene by scene but thought that's not really what I found so special about this and now even though it's still long uh, I, I hope I grabbed everything because this really was a journey and it was steeped in symbolism now for a lot of this for a lot of this, uh, you know, I, I consider myself more of a writer than I consider myself as a presenter, even though I like to present and I don't mind going off the cuff, but I like to really be careful with, with my thoughts. So for some of this, uh, I will be sort of reading what I had uh, written this afternoon as I was kind of going through this. Uh, so I, I hope that doesn't seem too jarring. Uh, I tried to kind of add little things and little ideas in between. I'm not, I'm not totally reading this whole time. Uh, I don't love listening to that sort of thing, but I hope the content of it makes sense. And know that even though it doesn't have the same kind of uh, off-the-cuff sort of feel to it, as if I'm having a conversation with you guys, which I like to do, this chapter, I just couldn't do that with uh, because it was just it was just really special. And I wanted to get it exactly exactly the way I wanted it to get, you know, knowing that I, I wasn't going to spend days and days on it. I just spent an afternoon kind of putting some thoughts down. So I do hope you enjoy it. Loved this chapter um, and can't wait to get on with it but i i think i may even reread some some points to it even if i just skim through it but there are things that i just want to make sure uh i really captured and, and because this was just so special so i will see you on the rest of this video and again this is just going to be audio only so you can you don't have to watch but uh i'll see you on the next one tapestry of chapter 7 is incredible. In my opinion, it gives us our most complete uh, chapter on its own. Of course, there are many things that lead into it. There's a lot of context. But uh, once you have that context, this could be... Uh, it really sends our characters on a complete journey. This could be the ending of a book and perfectly lead into a sequel. But, uh, you know, we're only 450 pages into this thing by the end of it. We witness a profound and introspective odyssey where our characters like moths drawn to flame venture into the heart of adversity in a way that maybe we haven't seen before. This chapter serves as a, a crucible for their souls, revealing the inherent power of destruction, chaos, and transformation that lies within their very beings. Through the veil of despair, they undergo a metamorphosis that challenges our deepest preconceptions ultimately leading them towards personal growth and unforeseen moments of hope amidst the darkest of shadows. In the crucible of fire, despair, and the unknown, the characters of Chapter 7 undergo a transformative journey that reshapes them almost to the point of rebirth. 
we see that idea of rebirth and just regular old birth uh, mentioned in this uh, in this chapter. It is through their experiences with destruction, though, unconventional means of using things like oil, which we'll talk about, descent into darkness, communion with the divine, where they transcend into uh, into a, a different way of being, a rebirth. Challenging their perceptions and emerging as individuals capable of profound growth and sometimes a little bit of that unexpected resilience. Erickson did something masterful with this chapter, guys. I have only had a day to ponder this major event in the series, not just in this book. And this is just what it means to me. As mentioned before, I do think that everything about this chapter is about transformation. As is, you know, a lot of these different chapters and, and moments. So first, let's begin with Leoman's encounter with the Queen of Dreams. This pivotal moment demands a careful unraveling. A tapestry of control and manipulation is shown here right into the very fabric i think i find myself captivated eager to explore the depths of this meeting between leoman and the queen of dreams i want to uncover its truth and i don't know uh with just this 24 hours that i've had with it if i've if i've really done that i find my ability to really understand its complexities wanting so far, but I am going to come back to this if there's something to find. Within the realm of Malazan, however, I do know that this mortal dance with gods and exchanges with deity often tips the scales in the deity's favor. So I don't know if this was a great thing for Leoman. I mean, I know it wasn't a great thing. It, it seems like that. But, it, uh, you know, we, we think he's doing something for himself. In the end, I, I'm not so sure. But I don't know. As I reflect on it, though, I, I can't help but question the true outcome that will come out of Leoman's apparent escape from his impending apocalypse that he brought on. He has eluded one fate it seems. But whispers of doubt do cloud my mind, casting a shadow over his future. In my eyes, he's a fallen scoundrel, someone that I really liked. But he is a figure that once was adorned with some level of grace to me, even though I, I'm, I'm not sure if I went back on a reread, if I would see, it, see him the same way. Uh, I, I just maybe didn't see all the clues, but now I, I see him just steeped in disgrace. This is one of the worst things that, uh, that any of these characters have done, I think. This meeting, though, like a delicate dance between marionettes, holds the potential for power plays and intricately woven manipulation. Leoman ensnared in the queen's presence becomes a pawn, potentially, in her enigmatic game. She holds the strings of his desires and fears, expertly pulling them to shape his path. Her agenda veiled in ethereal mystique, in the delicate balance, control hangs like a delicate thread taut with tension and ripe with possibilities. I, I'm just dying to know what's going to happen with Leoman. It, it seems like certainly this queen of dreams will have the upper hand here. I think. And as I delve deeper into the essence of this meeting, the more I think about it, I'm just compelled to untangle the enigma, to unearth the moments 
of control and manipulation that lie beneath the surface here. Leoman's destiny hangs in the balance, I feel. Suspended between the remnants of his fallen glory, if there was any glory to be had, and the uncertain path that lies ahead for him. I'm just, I, I'm, I, when I went into this book, I really was wanting to get back to Leoman. Because I really liked him. And, you know, I still find him to be a compelling character. But this was just, uh, this was pretty bad. Which is an understatement, but, you know. Okay, number two. We briefly need to bring up Crump. He is this, this character that just exploded into almost S tier for me. His very name expresses what he did in being the crumping of the cusser in bringing about the apocalypse. Now, there were several laugh out loud moments with Crump from his detonation to the song within the tunnels and other things, but this is not what this, uh, this video is going to be about. Third, now we have to talk about the unconventional use of olive oil. As somebody who loves symbolism and uses of certain materials, both in mythology, in our own history, the use of olive oil here was one of a few moments in this chapter. It certainly was the first one in this chapter that almost had me leaping out of my seat. Consider its usage in mythologies and how it has been viewed in the past. First, consider that as in ancient Greek mythology, olive oil had a matron goddess, same as in the world of Malazan. Within ancient Greek mythology, it was associated with, uh, oh, and also considered sacred by the goddess Athena. In fact, it was the gift of an olive tree offered to the city of Athens that won her patronage to that significant city. Within Greece and elsewhere, olive oil is seen as a symbol of peace, wisdom, prosperity, purity. It is used for religious rituals, offerings, anointings. Within the Bible, it is used as an, as an anointing oil to consecrate priests, kings, prophets. Consider olive oil in the story of Noah where a dove returned to the ark carrying the olive branch, symbolizing peace and the end of the flood. In many cultures, it is associated with fertility, abundance, longevity. It's used in cooking. It's a core commodity for trade. At least it was. It's a symbol of light and enlightenment, of truth. Its use represents illumination of knowledge and wisdom, especially amongst ancient Mediterranean cultures. Among the most important things to consider, I believe, especially as we see how it is misused in the siege of Egaton, are olive oil's healing and medicinal properties. It's safe to say that olive oil is pretty universally seen as a substance of peace, healing, truth, and goodness. Its specific use here might have cemented Steven Erickson as my favorite author. He really gets it. Or I think I'm, I mean, I might be reading too far into it, but I don't think I am, especially considering that there is specific mention of olive oil's matron deity, who would likely be very displeased by its misuse in the same way that I don't think Athena would be too pleased with it. Right? It really just adds this layer of spiritual consequence to Laoman's actions. This is a grave thing that he did. I mean, we also have Crump peeing on a stone altar and cracking it, uh, but that didn't exactly burn everyone alive by doing that. Everything in this significant city of Egatan has been anointed 
for destruction. Number four leads into fire as a catalyst for apocalypse, destruction, transformation, and rebirth. Fire acts as a transformative force, profoundly impacting each of these characters involved. In particular, Korab undergoes a metamorphosis reminiscent of Gruntles, in a sense, with Korab relinquishing the ideas of holy wars and embracing a newfound purpose. Smiles, Gessler, Captain Sort, and even the mysterious Crump and others also experience personal growth amidst the engulfing flames. All are subject to this new threat of just staying alive. The fire becomes a crucible, testing the characters and ultimately shaping their identities. Notably, uh, Korob witnessed the contemptible decision of his leader, who he loved, Leoman, and makes this conscious decision to protect those in the city rather than flee. Within the narrative, the unfolding events represent an apocalypse that seeks to consume everything in its path just like an elemental of flame. I think of the Panian Domin, how it had to spread and consume. And I feel that way also about this flame. The choices made, though, by the individuals like Korab, Truth, Fiddler, Sin, Bottle, Captain Sort, are integral to the journey towards the underground, where their destinies converge in the face of impending destruction. Of course, not everyone was down there, but you know what I mean. Okay, number five. The significance lies in the fact that their salvation, to a certain extent, is owed to the sacrifice of truth. The guide truth, but also truth. In my perspective, truth did not perish in that moment. Instead, truth became their savior or a part of their savior, or, you know, a part of their salvation, truth. Love the name there. Number six, Laoman of the feathers takes flight. You know, and this is in order of sequence, sort of. Korab saw a little bit while he was high on the frog of uh, about what Laoman really is. Laoman of the feathers. I just love that. Okay, number seven. In this moment, Korob's eyes flutter open. A profound transformation engulfs him. With unwavering determination, he vehemently dismisses the notion of retreat and betrayal, setting his sights on a revelation that awaits him. A purpose concealed within the depths of a desolate temple where 16 forsaken children, I think he was 16, await his guidance. In this pivotal moment, I, you know, I just fell in love with Korob. His vision transcends mere sight here. Finally, his eyes are opened, and he is penetrating the veil of his own blindness in this moment. As he prepares to venture into the labyrinthine tunnels ahead, he realizes that the darkness that lies ahead may be eclipsed by the newfound clarity of perception that he has attained. And he also mentions this, uh, a form of this as if he's, as he's talking with Fiddler later on, he, I can't remember exactly what he says, but I think it's as if he's finally out of chains. And I, and I think I wrote it down in my notes. So we'll see. Okay, number eight, another short one, Sin, which is such an interesting thing to, to name this person. Sin with two ends. Sin makes a pathway of dark, kind of this cleansing dark, this cool dark through the fire to help people as well. Now that is something I need to sit with because I, I don't exactly get uh, everything that's supposed to be gleaned from that, even though, you know, I just haven't had my full light bulb moment yet on that one. 
But it is interesting, and, and Sin will come back at the end here. But I am super intrigued, and I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay, number two leap out of my seat moment in this whole thing. You know, and, and everything was really neat, but it is this copper capstone or whatever you call it. The thing that uh, they're going to seal off this entrance or, or this escape into the tunnels from the temple. Now, we got to consider a couple more things. We considered olive oil. Now let's consider copper. And it won't be the last one. The last one's my favorite one. Copper is another material that has held much significance symbolically in various mythologies and cultural beliefs. While the specific meanings can vary across different mythologies and cultures, here are some common themes and associations attributed with copper in mythology. Okay, copper has been also associated with healing and protective properties in several mythologies. In ancient Egypt and Rome, specifically, copper was linked to the goddess Hathor or Venus, who is believed to bring healing energies. Copper amulets and talismans were worn as protection against negative energies and illnesses. Okay, in alchemical tradition, I, I can never say that, copper was connected to transformation, transformation and change. It was considered a metal associated again with Venus, representing the transformative power of love and also artistic expression. Okay, it was also a divine metal. Seen as a sacred metal next to silver next to gold its reddish color and natural luster was associated with the sun fire and divine energy copper was used often for religious artifacts temple decorations sacred objects in various mythologies now of course uh, a lot of this is coming from bronze age stuff so that's you know it was a metal that could be worked with so there are probably several reasons they used copper but they definitely viewed it in a, a certain light. Uh, conducts energy. Don't think I need to go so much into that. Uh, in certain folklore, though, actually, I should go into that. It it's uh, In some cultures, copper was considered to carry energy of the gods and was used for conducting spiritual energy in rituals and ceremonies. So you can think that all this stuff is happening above. We have burn, we have hood, we have the effects of polail. That might not be how to say that. But then maybe through this other copper, it's like this, this barrier, but also kind of, uh, in my eye, maybe relying on a new energy or, you know, something like that. I don't know. Uh, luck and prosperity in certain folklore, copper was believed to bring good fortune, abundance and prosperity. I think it's important to note that these associations may vary depending on the specific culture, but uh, very, very, very cool. And here it is used as a capstone to both seal them in the, this underworld and protect them from the fire and death above. And I just love its usage here. Okay. Number 10, I think. We either did number 9 or 10. Okay, but I think it's number 10. Finally, they make their way to this ancient temple. They uh, feel a little bit of this cool air coming from the ground, and they descend into this type of underworld below to escape fire and death. They embark on the descent into fear and the unknown. And I, I just think it's so amazing. And there's so much we can glean on. How many times do we see in mythologies people uh, enter for all these different reasons and circumstances into kind of out of fire or out of chaos into a, a type of nether world or a, 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 a different uh, uh, kind of an underworld. And in this book, you know, we had these stones that were in a circle and they're all facing kind of outwards. And then they, kind of, ah, man, what was it with? It was the, the, the talk with Cotillion. 
I got to go back because I'm just remembering that now. Uh, I can't remember all the details. But even though they're facing out in the other realm, they would be facing in. So I just think it's interesting that it's almost like this passage from above into into below. And I do think it's significant. I don't think it's just their way out. I think there really is something being said here. And it's happening as they descend from this ancient temple of all places. So they embark on the descent into the fear and unknown. And, and this just blew my mind. I, I do think it's just such a significant and transformative moment for these people. I believe the whole point of the chapter, though, lies in their destination below. I really do. And I think this is what Steven Erickson meant. At least this is something I get out of it. And there's a lot to be made of the connection of these two realms above and below. But, you know, we don't have to go super into that. I already made my point, maybe. But we do find here that it seems to have this other kind of uh, aspect to it. In this sacred convergence of the two worlds, the fabric of their reality intertwines with the enigmatic force at play, hinting at a grander narrative. It is within this uncharted domain of what once was and what is now buried, largely still intact, where the ethereal threads of fate and destiny appear to weave together, that the true essence of their quest begins to unfurl. All right, number 11, and, and this is the big one for me. And I think this is, uh, you know, you can take it however you want, uh, but of course there's, <laughs> of course we got to have some hallucinogenic hallucinogenic, I always say that wrong, uh, honey down here. But this is, this was the big one for me. I, uh, as soon as I see, saw these urns, I started thinking of all these different substances, considering all this other symbolic stuff that we had with the oil, with the copper, uh, with all these names. And I thought, what is he going to put? What has he drawn on? And it is just by far my favorite element of this entire sequence. There are so many connections between honey and the underworld in mythologies. One notable example is found in Greek mythology where honey is specifically associated with the realm of the dead, known as Hades. In Greek mythology, we have the goddess Persephone, who is abducted by Hades, the god of the underworld, to become queen or his queen and wife. So during that time, she was persuaded to eat some pomegranate seeds, which bound her to the realm of Hades. As a compromise between Demeter and Hades, it was decided that Persephone would spend one third of, it, of the year in the underworld and the two thirds of the remaining in, or the remaining two thirds in on earth. When Persephone returned to earth, the land bloomed with life and when she went back into the underworld, winter fell upon the world. But in some versions of this myth, it is said that while in the underworld, Persephone was offered a drink of honey. And honey was served as a symbol of the sweet nectar of the gods. And its consumption represented a binding connection between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. So when they took the honey and they started to kind of lose it, I thought, oh, oh, here we go. This is not going to be just a, a, a hallucination. This is going to be some kind of extra connection. I don't think it was a hallucination. I think there was something more here. And I just think of the pots that they talked about in the prologue and all this mentioned that there is truth below found beneath the sands and things like that. Again, I think of truth who just died above in the fire. Uh, you know, I'm going to think about all this so much. Uh, I may just reread this chapter again. I may actually take a few days off just to think about this chapter and really get my mind straight because this was such a big moment. Anyway, think of that. This honey that acts as a connection in to some 
unseen realm. And most importantly, at least to me, consider honey's depiction or its property as a transformative substance in mythology. I may be reading too far in this, but I don't think I am. And I feel like there's so much to be gleaned. I do think it's more than just a hallucinogen. This honey has each of them coming face to face with something deep within them, something deeply significant, sometimes just as observers. Uh, and it seems like they are witnessing these gods. There's this dung beetle god who tries to recruit balm to eat through eat through uh, the ground into the abyss. We have Crump, who uh, the salamander says, hey, mortal, grab my tail. And then when he finally does it, takes off the tail bit, breaks off. He's holding it there. Uh, my favorite one was with Smiles, and I'll talk about that more uh, in, a, in a bit. I think, I think of uh, Fiddler, who has this connection with, with Hedge. Now think of Fiddler. They even talk about this. They even talk about how Fiddler is the connection uh, between these two realms for the for the bridge burners. They, he they have to he has to take them with him. It was something like that. So this honey provides a type of communion with the gods as the characters journey into the deep iterations of the city. They experience divine interactions that blur the line between hallucinations hallucination and truth i think these encounters raise all sorts of questions about the nature of what the heck is going on suggesting that profound revelations may be found in the mysterious depths here beneath the ground but maybe i got a little bit of that honey in me i don't know maybe i'm going crazy each character carries with them a deeply personal and profound experience. Something they hold on to. One of them uh, remembers this bear cub that got trapped and, and this is like reliving this hard moment. Uh, this wasn't a honey moment, I don't think, but someone above Polk or... Man, wish I remembered his name. Remembering his mother, apologizing for skinning his knee. And uh, we have this moment with smiles i guess i'll just mention this now uh that she is seeing herself as she is kind of being carried away or something from these from these uh elder deities and being chained and i think of troll now i may be getting this all wrong uh and it will necessitate a, a reread for sure, but I see so many connections being made. She's being chained, almost offered up, and expected to submit. And in this way, if she was to submit, she is to be this counterbalance in the ancient struggle between order and chaos. Without full submission, it doesn't work. She's to be bound in chains like Troll and made to wait for the waters of mail to pass over, like Troll. We also had uh, this, this uh, flood was about to happen before Gothos uh, talked to him, I, I think. Uh, you know, mail just keeps flooding the place. And it makes me rethink of this, this chaining that Troll was in. And instead of just submitting, uh, submitting she resists. I think of the ice fields, and how many times people may have been offered in this way. Or I may just be off my rocker. But I don't know. But it's just amazing that this honey kind of uh, makes the connection a little bit uh, a little bit closer. So cool. So cool. And I, again, I just think maybe the coolest part of that is Fiddler and his role between uh, his role uh, or his connection between the living and the dead. 
Okay, number 12 or 13 or whatever I'm on. Uh, I see so much in terms of the themes of despair and its counterbalance hope in this chapter. It just explores all sorts of depths of despair, showcasing the loss of lives, the crumbling city, the dark tunnels into the unknown, the fear of reaching rock bottom and eventual death, sometimes stalling and having moments of panic and crisis and these poor kids. And then following this rat, a small light out of the underworld. And I can't imagine that coming out of this tunnel wouldn't be completely akin to rebirth. I think it was Nether or Nil that mentioned that something will be reborn this day. Perhaps many things will be reborn this day. This feels like a, a bridge burner moment. It's just such a beautiful journey that they go through, evading fire, death, disease. They journey down into the underworld following a rat and rebirth from a cliffside anew. They are journey journeying through a burned, a burning ancient city, hoping that they do not hit rock bottom. There is immense fear when they stop. Think of the emotional journey of that night. Again, especially for these kids. While below, it is as if they encounter a type of inner demon or something buried deep within themselves or something that they need to see. They could be ensnared in chains in this moment, I guess, maybe, in a sense, by giving up or dying. Or as with smiles, they can fight the chains and release themselves. Lastly, Fiddler, as my poster boy bridge burner, represents that beautiful motto, as he was the tip of the spear going into the siege, and the one to seal the tunnel off and emerge from the underworld. First in, last out. I, I just love Fiddler. You know, everyone... Everyone uh, who, all these bridge burners, I, I do love them in some way, but he seems like the best of them. And how beautiful is it to have Korob, a former super believer in the resistance, have this greatest transformation of them all as he helps my favorite bridge burner to safety. And if I did have to guess, Strings has been restored to Fiddler. A rebirth to what potentially he was before or, or something else, but I feel like he will go by Fiddler. Now, I, I you know, not a big deal if, if he still goes by Strings because that's, you know, he uses Strings when he lies and Fiddler when he tells the truth, but I think there's more to that than just uh, that explanation there. Koreb was a major part of that. And I would guess that he will now uh, be Fiddler again. It's just amazing, this chapter. And I think it is all about this, uh, this, you know, it, it's not just about the fire and the escape. It's about this cusser that goes off. It's about this olive oil it's about this trap, this terrible thing that Leoman did. And now they have a real apocalypse on their hand. And yet, as they are going down, it was that uh, bald, uh, what was his name? The fat one. He mentions, if I ever see the sun again, I might just get on my knees and worship it. And he says, if there was, if only there was a, a God of freedom. And that's when I thought, holy smokes, holy smokes, that is so poignant. And I, I also wonder, you know, this rat was sending him out. Uh, and I thought, is, is this being, is a, is a God really kind of 
stepping in here. Um, what kind of God would represent freedom? You know, there's all these different people worshiping all these different things. We have this thousand finger God. I don't know if that's what is going on here, but some kind of God that would uh, reach in and intervene uh, on, on people's behalf, regardless of their background, uh, snagging them out of the underworld. And it's just so interesting that they would see sin's hand. Isn't that interesting? Being pulled out. Now, you know, the, the major things in this chapter was the, the big changes of Korab and Laoman. He's just changed so much. I already loved Korab. But he is no more about the cause alone. He's cast off his chains. So I did write this note. He says, Fiddler, I was thinking, here I am trapped. And yet, it is only now, I think, that I have finally escaped my prison. Funny, isn't it? Gessler goes down. Uh, knows that they are close to the end, offers to help, and then Fiddler says that, uh, I can't remember exactly, but he says that I'm in the most capable hands here. They're just the best of bros, I guess. I just love it. I just love it. And and I'm not going to rush to get to chapter 8. I do want to sit with this a little bit. I do want to go back to some other things. If you know some other significant uh, things in the names, in the materials used, in the, you know, the symbology or, or whatever, let me know. I'm all for that. Uh, this was an amazing, amazing chapter. The best one, probably, so far. And I'm just looking forward to seeing uh, where it goes. It's just, uh, it's just one more moment in in a, a series filled with amazing moments. Now, I'll talk about maybe some of the humor and some of the other things that happen uh, as we go, because there was like five things that made me laugh out loud, uh, starting with Crump, uh, with the cusser, the, the sappers that just recently turned into... Uh, you know, turned into sappers. They, instead of throwing them, they just ran in the building. Uh, Crump singing that song, finding out that Crump is a high marshal of the Ma Irregulars, who I already loved so much. It's just, it's just so many moments. And, and there's even more than that. But I feel for these children, and I loved, I gotta mention this, when they all get out, the children are saved, everyone's saved, all these people that came through the tunnel, after thousands of people did die, but these people got out, and I feel like this this chapter really is about them. Um, the children feel, it seems like, most comfortable around smiles. They go in there sitting around smiles. I just loved that. Just, there's so many moments in this in this chapter that did well by so many characters. I think of Bottle. Korob, Cutter, Smiles, we have this dead smell, we have uh, Captain Sort, holy smokes, what a great chapter for her. They have this new rat called Egatan, so, many, so much significance probably there. Uh, I just can't wait to see what else happens. I just want to know so much. This was an amazing chapter, and I'll talk to you guys on the next one.